Good afternoon or good evening, good morning, everyone, wherever the time zone you are in, greeting of the hour to you. So we here today, um, got, we have about 60, 72 participants right now. Uh, we, are, we have about 250 participants registered for this webinar. We, we, we're looking at the African perspective. We are, we are looking back to take stock and looking forward to build for the future or build back better. We, you, you all know how the COVID-19 came and disrupted systems. The motions that we were on were truncated, plans were blown away, people were restructured, workplaces were disorganized, and existence or life was almost coming to a halt. But the question we are asking with this, with this webinar, what did we get right? And what did we get wrong? The things that we got that we didn't get right, what were responsible? What were the hiccups that didn't allow us to achieve the expected results? We saw how overwhelming the healthcare system globally became. And Africa has always been, been not, not indicted, yes, that's the right word, that we have what you call high fragile healthcare systems. And that played out also during COVID-19. How are our healthcare systems, how are they managed? How, how are the policy reforms as it concerns healthcare system in Africa? Is healthcare system in Africa really a healthcare system or is a medical system? How, how, is the, how are the governance processes? We know that healthcare is multi, multi, um, it's multidisciplinary, and everyone within the value chain needs to be duly included while giving care to our people. Is this what we have in Africa? If not, what are the difficulties? What do you think we can do better in building the Africa that we want? There is no economy, no region in the world can survive without a healthy population. We need to start speaking to the health of our people, start, start creating, creating solutions that will make health of our people improve. And this is why this webinar has become so, so important to us. So we'll look at this together. We don't, we don't feel we know it all. That's why we have everyone gathered here. We are going to do illicit discussions. From this discussion, wherein may come out solutions that we need to build better into the future. So in this, in this webinar that we have about one hour, one hour, uh, one and a half hours to spend, we have three key speakers. I have, I have, with, we, I have with, with us here, Dr. Mimun and Kadiri. I actually, actually want to I actually refer to her as a celebrity shrink because that's what she calls herself. So she's, she's a mental health physician, a very strong, a very strong healthcare advocate in Nigeria. She's a trusted hand and her voice has been loud in this direction. So when this discussion started, I said the person who will speak along this line is Dr. Kadiri. So Dr. Kadiri will be talking to us shortly, but we also have two other speakers. We have um, uh, Mrs. Chiwenwe Chandimba, who is the senior uh, uh, policy expert in African Union Development Agency. I work with her closely. You know, um, when you say when you say Africa has Africa has women that have force, this is one of them. So she will be standing by. She's done so much work in pol in policy across Africa, and I want to hear from her later. We also have a very good friend who have, who are, who recently I refer to as my brother because I find out that we keep walking along along same path. Doctor Moyo Dingani tirelessly developing system for improvement of occupational health and safety across Africa. Dr. Dr. Moyo Dingani is from Zimbabwe. I mean, his work that he has done speaks for him. Uh, Chiwewe Chamdimba is from South Africa. So these are the key speakers we have today. And, doc, and Dr. Memuna Kadiri is from Nigeria. So we have these three key speakers that will speak to us today. So I will allow Dr. Kadiri to share her slides because she, she will, she will She's going to bring up a discussion through the slide that she has that we elicit for that discussion, set a chart for what we're going to do today. So, Dr. Kadiri, please. 
again good morning afternoon evening depending on the part of the world we are in this is our new normal and we are adapting to the new change uh, most of our works are now basically over 90 percent online i am i still remain dr Mimuna kadri a leading and vital voice for mental health in africa changing the narratives normalizing mental health conversations and creating safe spaces in order to achieve healthier, wealthier, and of course, happier individuals for a just and equitable society. And I'm just so glad I'm here to talk about the African perspective on occupational safety and health in times of COVID-19. I happen to be one of the think tank members of Lagos State COVID-19 group, which is, if you, follow the trend, Lagos State is our epicenter for the COVID-19 in, in Nigeria. And it has been a roller coaster of emotions, roller coaster of changes, adaptation, survivor. So if you are here on board today, congratulations, you are alive. And of course, we keep praying, may the souls of the ones we've lost, whether you know them or you don't know them on a global perspective, may they continue to rest in, in peace. This is just an overview of occupational health, and I don't think I need to go into that. I'm happy I have awesome speakers with me talking on policy and, you know, um, OHS um, documentation reform. So I will just give a broader view of what we are going to talk about to this set a pace and get the other speakers to deep dive into the whole uh, view of the African perspective. So generally the OHS is just about, you know, health and we all know initially it was about manual labor and occupation, but now it's everything is all encompassing. And that's why I like the fact that he said, health sector, is it health or medical? And I'm going to get down to why that question is very pertinent. If we want to make changes, it has to start with us as key stakeholders and make sure that we build an ecosystem that is sustainable because sustainability is the watchword as it is right now. So COVID happened. <laughs> COVID happened. I'm alive to laugh about it. I had COVID, my family had COVID. I think I had it twice. I had it before it was declared COVID-19, which is the SARS, because um, COVID-19 is a, in name is a strain, different strain of SARS, right? So I had SARS before COVID was declared as COVID-19. And then COVID came, I thought I could have built some immunity and I still had it, you know, but I'm still here to smile and laugh over it. And I'm just hoping that the long time effect wouldn't uh, be um, an issue for me. I've had my first jab of the vaccine and hoping that the second jab, which is next month will come on time from indication COVAX, you know, providing that we'll be able to get up. But generally the African perspective of COVID-19, you know, it has impacted us in ways that we never expected. They were the good, we can't take away that. They were the bad, and of course the worst case scenarios came. The worst case scenarios, obviously were, you know, debt, right? But of course the bad case scenarios were the fact that within this global pandemic, there, were two, there are two other pandemic ruling that haven't been declared global. One of it is increase in gender-based violence, and the second one is, is the increase in mental related issues. And those are changes that are ongoing right now that can impact people even post-COVID era. And those are some of the things I'll be glad that we discuss even right here on this platform. But what the good things, you know, those that didn't like the off-site work, working remotely, a lot of family bonding time, a lot of, you know, the clubhouse came about this time around, TikTok became the order of the day, you know, a lot of, um, you know, drama online. I remember the, the young lady, is it a Kenya that work, that won the Nickelodeon Kid uh, Award because of, you know, our fun activities online, especially during the major lockdowns and all. So there were the good things that came with it. And it also reminded us that cleanliness is next to godliness. You know, better sanitation, environmental cleaning, hand washing, some minor things that we forgot, you know, we just took for granted. All that came into, you know, that, uh, you know, um, as a reminder, and of course, some new things that we had to learn. But what are these our issues? 
when it came to COVID-19, <laughs> there were major issues, especially in Africa. Issues, our challenges, and of course the trials that came with it. Availability of PPE, the protective gear was a major cause at the beginning. In fact, I remember I'm going to some hospitals because we're the ones working in the front line and making um, our COVID centers, making sure that things were in place. Some hospitals had to shut down because they didn't have the ideal protective gear. And this was not only in Nigeria, it cut across most of the African countries. In the issue was so overwhelming that we now had healthcare workers you know, breaking down, dying, and, you, and the healthcare system in Africa is generally very fragile. It's worse in some African countries than in other African countries. It just made the world to realize that no matter the amount of money you have, your health is very paramount and health actually is worth because people died even when they know they were zillionaires. I'm not talking about billionaires, zillionaires. They could buy, they could get replacement, but money couldn't buy them anything at that point. So when it came to the frontline head workers, the major issues were non-availability of uh, protective gear. And this, was, this is a major occupational hazard because doctors, nurses, you know, the um, community health extension workers, the pharmacists, the laboratory workers, People were averse of doing their jobs because they didn't have the right gear to wear and nobody wants to die. You know, that is just a human behavior. It's not particular to Africans, it's general. And that was one thing that, you know, with time gradually started changing because that opened doors to Africans to now look inward and started producing their own protective gear and you know with time those other things change and of course non-availability of major issue and disinfectant cleaning agent they were there but they were specific to what needs to be done how things need to be uh, put in place and the laws and that's why i like the fact that a policymaker is on board there's so many reforms you know so many laws that have been in place but how were they implemented and have they been properly executed and when it comes to occupational health issues these policies were very key you know, if we had to be doing a lot of training in infectious disease control and um, training in, in standardization of protocols you know for smaller groups or bigger groups because not only uh, we did have government established isolation centers. We had private sector driven isolation centers. And that cuts across Africa. You know, so there were so many issues that you know, um, places that needed that train the trainer, retraining to get things right. And that was something that, you know, um, initially started on a slow, very slow um, rate. And with time, started building up. When the second wave hit, that was it. The first wave, it was still more a lot of issues. People thinking, oh, this is a Wuhan virus. This is Chinese virus. Conspiracy theorists coming on board to say it's 5G, 7G. So many, you know, conspiracy theories surrounding that. But of course, with the second wave, and in South Africa, it was even worse because, you know, a new variant and people were now knowing that this is not just about COVID-19 is about our anyhowness and our attitude in where we approach, you know, managing our health generally, not just COVID. Because we were hit with Ebola in 2014. What did we take away from Ebola and why shouldn't we implement it? And that was one thing that helped some countries. For example, in Nigeria, because we had Ebola at that point in time, the bio banks were some, we had to, major bio banks then. So when the COVID came, it was easier to build on those existing bio banks and also bio security and every other thing, you know, um, um, not, you know, were properly induced and that helped. So Lagos would be the epicenter and had more um, reformed, you know, institutions and proper policies and documentation put in place. It was not used as a yastic for other states to, 
put in place what they need to do, how they need to do it. And even the presidential task force had to, you know, get some information from us to be able to execute um, other things that they needed to do. And of course, the people thinking it is still a myth and the conspiracy theories that I talked about, this was our major issues. I know it's not only in Africa that the, the conspiracy theorists were, you know, um, having issues with, you know, um, in, in America during the era of Donald Trump and all the, you know, the talk about COVID or what he had COVID, then a major um, um, uh, force about a doctor came up on board to talk about it is not, you know, this, it, this doesn't warrant uh, vaccine development. You just take some certain um, medication and everything goes away. And the knowledge and attitude of healthcare workers, you know, that was also something that we needed to put on board. So the training and operational um, hazard issues you know, brought on board were major things that we needed to put in place in, in, in doing um, in the African perspective when it came to COVID-19. But of course, we do know that there were effects. There's nothing in this nature, this magnitude, that will not bring effect to it. A lot of <laughs> remote working. Um, downsizing. So financial insecurity came on board. Or, um, organizations closed. Let's not, we are talking about operational health here. Companies closed. In fact, there are some companies that shut down now that will never see the, uh, uh, will never resonate again because there is no way they can um, make traction. They were not able to diversify. They were not able to partner or build alliances. They just felt they, they, were, they couldn't do anything. So people lost their jobs. People that cannot really work remotely had to work remotely. Let's not forget when we are seeing Africa, not all countries in Africa have the 24 hours light, you know, good network mobile system that can give you internet, internet very slow. So, and when it comes to remote working, those are things that are very key, light, um, um, network, um, mobile network working to make sure that you have the right data. Those also were things that were, you know, hindering proper working from home and remote working, then the lockdown. So you found out that financial insecurity became an issue now. And in fact, even post COVID era, that is going to be um, something where we have to, we have to deal with. Then the young people, some of them started realizing the parents, the parents they know were not the real parents that they know. I, I think I need to repeat that. The parents that they thought they know were not the real parents that they, you know, they, they saw at the time when, you know, the lockdown ex especially, some found themselves in, in a hostile environment, toxic relationship. And of course that the increase in gender-based violence increased. Let's not forget we have different personality traits, different people, so the extrovert, they couldn't just be it. The introvert, it could have been easy for them because they want to be behind the scene. But the extrovert, they couldn't because um, uh, leisure areas were closed, cinemas were closed, hubs were closed, shops were closed, which is global, right? But that was one thing that you know a lot of the young people couldn't deal with because social interaction and a lot of them had to do online schooling which wasn't something that they you know kind of really uh when they were looking forward to maybe a month or two but it prolonged i remember when <clears throat> my children's school eventually opened uh eight months later my boys, the, the school debated whether to come online or go offline, to come to school or still continue home, um, online schooling. They sat my, myself and my husband down and said, dad, mom, I appreciate the fact that you people have been taking care of us for the past eight months, but we want to go back to school. Like, you know, literally they were tired about, you know, staying at home, not relating with friends and other people. So a lot of safety related issues came on board and that also led to, you know, the mortality. So one thing I need to be able to bring on board here is that there were a lot of projection about the mortality. We have, uh, there was going to be a lot of mortality, body bags and all that, but you know, that didn't, it's, this is not what we are seeing right now. And of course, a lot of studies are talking about the fact that we are quite a number of us in sub-Sahara region we've been treating malaria over time. The sunlight we receive, which was, you know, which is still very beautiful here, the skin, our eating, and then of course, um, the Ebola period, what we have learned and we use them during this period. But psychologically, 
like what I said, the good, the bad, and the ugly. This has affected us globally. In Africa, we are not exempted. And collectively, we've been traumatized. And one way that mentally we are dealing with this is just look at the acronym on board using the word pandemic. Mo most people didn't know that there was a word called pandemic. But this period brought that on board, the word pandemic. And you know, just knowing how this affected us mentally, panic, there was anxiety, not sleeping where people had depression, which was you know, it's on the increase, expressing suicidal thoughts, you know, maladaptive coping mechanism, impaired thought processes, which led to the, you know, the conspiracy theories and confusion. Don't wear face masks, wear face masks. Don't use this. It's not airborne, it's airborne. There was so much confusion, which is even still ongoing right now. But what are we going to do differently? Vaccine has come. Yes. Some of us have taken the first jab. South Africa opted for the J and J Johnson and Johnson. Nigeria has AstraZeneca because of our word that we couldn't get Pfizer, Moderna, and other African countries. Uh, but we vaccine equity is still very, very far away from us in Africa. Very, very far. If we have to rely on vaccine to get herd immunity, that will not work because we see how that slow you know, deployment of vaccine and all that. But from the occupational health perspective, the most important thing I want to preach here is for us to build sustainable ecosystem. Healthcare system is not medical care system, it's healthcare. This means all hands have to be on deck. All hands to have to be on deck, the doctors, the nurses, the pharmacists, the laboratory physicians, uh, technicians, the policy makers, the community health extension workers, occupational health hazard, but everybody, that is the only way we can make this work in the African perspective and even on a global perspective. Our healthcare system here is very fragile and we need to understand that advocating for change has to start with us and by ensuring that everybody, when they come on board, the ego will be let go and for us to focus on goal-directed, result-oriented, policies and reforms that will help us at this point in time to get help. So as I round up, I want to tell everybody, you are important. You are your own biggest asset. So you need, as a human being, whether you're in Africa or any part of the world, to begin to look and take care of yourself so that you will not burn, burn out. Because when you burn out, you are going to be useless to yourself and of course, useless to others. So you need to take care of yourself because if you don't do so now, when, and if not now, then when? Thank you very much. Oh my word. Thank you so much, Dr. Kadiri. Those were words that are so stimulating. You can, you can, you can put out like a very, very deep summary of what, who we are, what we are, what the system is. And um, ladies and gentlemen, I hope we all heard her loud and clear. So this is how it is. And um, we need to start speaking to this and seeing how it was, what it is now, and how we can build back better. Thank you so much. Those were very inspiring, inspiring presentations and the slides and the words were very strong and compelling. And we'll build on that with other speakers that are around and uh, while we, while we uh, take the discussion forward. Thank you very much. We really appreciate that presentation. Thanks a lot. So we all have her and uh, dear panelists, uh, uh, dear fellow panelists, colleagues, we heard the bomb that this woman dropped. You have the right to counter it, to validate it. Uh, let's, let's move forward and build a better Africa. So on this note, um, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I have, I have two women sandwiching one man. Let me bring him in so that it don't look like... <laughs> Let me bring Dr. Moyo in. Dr. Moyo, you need to come in right now to help all that Dr. Dr. Kadiri brought on board. We need to hear from you. She made very critical, critical um, points. This concerns us all. If we must build an, uh, if we must build a vibrant Africa that will, that will be comfortable to leave behind for our children, it means all hands have to be on deck. In Zim you are from Zimbabwe. How how is the head policy from where you where you live and what you are you work across many countries in Africa? The head policies we have in Africa were they friendly to people or gave or they were they were they were that kind of policy that that created that 
inclusion for everyone to, to be relevant when we had COVID-19. And if that was not the case, what do you think we could have done better when COVID-19 came? And how did this policy, how did it truncate the progress of good out outcomes that we all could have recorded? Dr. Moyo, please. Thank you very much, Ayn. Thank you very much to uh, Dr. Gadiri for the excellent uh, presentation. That was quite superb. Uh, like you rightfully say, I have had quite extensive experience within uh, the SADAC region in terms of occupational health. I'm going to speak to that in terms of uh, the preparedness of the Southern African states um, uh, to this pandemic. Let me just uh, bring your attention to the fact that um, we all know that uh, on a global infancy stage with very weak systems programs uh, where even the basics, the fundamentals, they've not really been um, quite um, uh, strong. So from my experience, what I know, especially in the Southern African states, even from literature review, you have seen that uh, very few countries um, actually have occupational safety and health policies generic in order to deal with such eventualities. So we are coming from um, a, a perspective or from a, a background where inadequacies in systematic and comprehensive and holistic approach to COVID-19 has really been very fragmented. Um, one important issue that I think uh, the pandemic has brought through, it has brought our awareness to our fragmented, um, inadequate occupational safety and health management systems per se across, I wouldn't say it's only Southern Africa, but the entirety of Africa and uh, also outside of Africa where the field and the discipline of safety and health has really been um, uh, underlooked and uh, undervalued. So when it came, when, when the pandemic struck, obviously in a coordinated and systematic approach, you would expect to activate your occupational safety and health management system, your risk management system. In this particular case, we've been dealing with a biological hazard, of course, with multiple manifestations which unfortunately, um, the, the, the management or the realization of these has not been uh, to maybe to expectation, but yes, congratulations, not only to Africa, but even to the world for a swift response towards COVID-19. Uh, but of course, we find that in every sector, all countries responded. Looking at the Southern African states, yes, um, of prominence in South Africa, that comes in, but uh, generally there was a swift response. But I must say, we could have done better if we had a mature, comprehensive, fundamental occupational safety and health management system. Then in terms of policies, like I said earlier on, very few countries uh, do have an occupational safety and health uh, um, uh, policy. Uh, fortunately, like uh, for Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe uh, established in national OSH policy, and um, that in a way also brought in a new uh, complexion to the approach to what's called particularly in the workplace. Um, uh, that's what I can say at, at this present moment, but um, maybe let me also speak towards the health workers. Uh, I liked what I was saying, are we looking from coming from a medical perspective or from a health perspective? I think all along, uh, most countries, most professionals, we have concentrated on the medical approach where everything really that is got to do with the biological hazard is centered, has been centered on um, uh, the, 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 the medical approach. But um, looking at the, at the wellness, safety, and health of health workers, in as much as uh, these cadres are driven with the determination and the dedication to save lives. But we all know that the health and well being and safety of health workers has been greatly neglected to the point that most uh, frontline workers, even during this pandemic, you, you rarely find a um, comprehensive or even at least a basic management system to cater for the frontline workers. Shows you that uh, even in terms of the response to COVID 19, 
across countries. Very few countries have really brought to prominence even the, 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 the psychosocial support to our frontline workers or even uh, some basic occupational health services to our frontline workers. That in itself has been quite um, uh, a challenge. Maybe for the time being, let me stop here. We can, uh, I'll continue. Thank you so much, Dr. Moyo. That was well put together. Thank you so much. You, well, you, 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 you've opened up the new space again, and which of course will bring me to Dr. Chip, uh, to Mrs. Chiwewe Chandimba. You know, you, you, you spoke, you, you touched a whole lot of issues, and I need to bring this across to Chim now. Most of the things that we couldn't achieve, I mean, that, that, we, that we'll say didn't allow us to get the kind of outcomes that we should have gotten when COVID-19 came. I think, personal view though, I think most of them came from policy. Across, across countries in Africa, as much as I know, we see healthcare systems as a place that must be governed by clinicians. But I think in some few, I, I used to think it, it, this was peculiar to Africa, but I also found out that across a number of countries, even outside Africa, that also happens. But I, I personally feel, I mean, from, from studies, if we have healthcare administrators, if we have public health experts, if we have health economists, manage healthcare systems, I think we'll have better outcomes. Because at that level, what you're looking at is management administration. Are you, you understand that most of the uh, medical college curriculum, they don't have this as part of the modules they have to, they have, they, doctors are made to undergo before they finish their medical school. In some countries, we've seen cases where health economists, Nigeria as an example, health economist was appointed as a minister for health, and Nigeria was placed on the pedestal of growth. Why? Because he wasn't really a core clinician. Do, Chin, do you think this policy in Africa that we can review, that's, what, that's part of what you do in Africa Union Development Agency, how do we chart a course in reviewing this policy that, that, that places less clinicalization of the healthcare sector so that there can be all inclusion of every profession that is put together for good patient outcome and good running and administration of African healthcare systems? Please speak to us on this. Chim, please. Um, th thank you very much, uh, Enghi. Actually, I'm going to take it up from where you've left and uh, where uh, Dr. Moyo also touched on in terms of the gaps where COVID found us. Because I think unless we reflect on where we are coming from, where COVID found us, what was the situation and what did it mean? Or, and what does it still mean? Because as we are speaking, we are still in the COVID pandemic. What does it mean in the fight against um, COVID-19? But also the other question is, is COVID-19 the first pandemic? Is COVID-19 the first emergency or the first outbreak? And I think that answer uh, from all of us would be, no, it is not. Um, our earlier speaker talked about the issue that Africa has gone through a number of outbreaks, Ebola, um, and other outbreaks that have been emerging over the years and even the globe. But I think how have we come out of those pandemics and how have we used those lessons to inform how we respond to this pandemic and future pandemics? Because I think this, as much as it is not the first, it is also not the last. We will still see more outbreaks, more pandemics coming in. But I think the issue is how do we respond better? And when we look at the policy space, uh, in the African context, Dr. Moyo talked about the gaps, the deficiencies, and the, um, the lack of um, up-to-date policy frameworks and regulatory frameworks to regulate the health space. And you've touched on the issue of multisectorality of health and requiring different expertise in the view to fight against the pandemic. You will realize that, as you're rightly saying, um, previously, we've looked at health as a health issue that has to be addressed by people that have been trained within health. 
But I think what COVID-19 has shown us is that it is not only health, the health sector that could respond to COVID-19. During the pandemic, you saw, I mean, and all of us, we saw a number of structures being formed at the national, regional, and continental level. That involved a number of stakeholders, a number of sectors to effectively respond to the pandemic. If you see the impact that COVID had on the economy, if you look at the impact that COVID had in the different workplaces, the closing down of the economy, the procurement of um, our earlier speaker talked about PPEs and other basic health commodities that were required for the fight against COVID-19. Most definitely you realize that you need experts from different fields to be able to fulfill those challenges that came about because of COVID-19. But I think one thing we need to realize is that, yes, we are talking about all these challenges. Yes, we are talking about all these gaps, but I think we were lucky somehow to the extent that as a continent, the, the, the pandemic did not catch us unaware. Probably we picked a few lessons from what happened during the um, uh, uh, Ebola pandemic, and they were useful and fundamental in the fight against COVID-19. The structures that were set up at the continental level were the same structures that were used in the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. More to say, if you look at a structure like the Africa CDC, I'll give an example as one of the fundamental components that has been set up in response to Ebola, but we see how it has been effective in the fight against the uh, pandemic we are currently in. And you see how the establishment of the Africa CDC at the continental level has had a very fundamental impact in making a difference in countries setting up their own public health institutes. And the most important part is that in those public health institutes, you will see that it's not only people within health that have been working within the public health institute, because we're looking at the multicentrality of the impact of the outbreaks and the pandemics that we have had. Also, I would like to give an example. When we look now, let's zero into occupational health and safety um, that uh, we currently are focusing on. When you look at the continent, we had started doing something. I think the establishment of OSH Africa itself, the discussions that we had in the OSH Africa conference that was happened in, for instance, in here in South Africa, had a fundamental impact in pushing countries to reform their occupational health and safety systems. And you could see the AU also through its African Union Development Agency where we are, starting to take efforts to reform the landscape when it comes to occupational health and safety. And I want to talk about three key things that we looked at and we saw that are fundamental to have a successful reform process. Firstly, the issue that one country cannot go it alone. Dr. Moyo talked about the lack of expertise. You will realize that in most African countries, the expertise are not there. And for us to go one by one, we will not be able to push this agenda. But if we come together as a region, that's one of the things that we've learned and we have realized that that has helped us a lot in pulling together the resources that we have, in facilitating the learnings that the continent needs to push forward for us to advance occupational health and safety. It also has helped us in developing some guidelines developing some harmonized policies that countries have been able to adapt and implement at the country level. Secondly, the issue of multisexuality. We have set up a community of practice. You remember in, uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we even came together as African Union to say, yes, we know our capacities because we don't have these policies and guidelines, but if we don't have the capacities to implement them, then they mean nothing. We came together and formed a group of experts. That has helped us to implement trainings, to develop guidelines that countries have been able to adapt at the national level. And lastly, the issue of a systems approach. It's not, it's not only about policies. Policies can be there, but if they are not implemented, they mean nothing. So yes, policies. Secondly, issues around building a cadre of experts required to push those policies forward as well as designing systems that will enable us to generate more information, 
feeding back into the system, informing practices and informing um, the way we do things. Last thing that I want to leave us with, what, what can we consider as success factors? What do we need to do in order for us to better respond to future pandemics and outbreaks? Seven key things, leadership and commitment. What we have seen is that there's some leadership and commitment coming in, but we need more champions. These have taken a long time. It's difficult to push these agendas unless we have leadership and commitment. Number two, well-structured policies and regulatory frameworks. We've talked about that. I'm not going to go into detail. Three, human capital. Four, data, research, knowledge sharing, and peer learning. Five, more funds for health and more health from those funds. And six, health in all sectors, the multisectorial nature of health. And lastly, partnerships, partnerships, partnerships. We've been able to move a step forward because we have established strategic partnerships, key partnerships. I know we are sitting here because we've been able to work with Ocean Africa. I talked earlier that we have also worked with Workplace Health Without Borders to be able to train more people. And I think these partnerships are critical for us to move forward the issue of reforms when it comes to occupational health and safety. So thank you very much, moderator. Those, that is the input that I wanted to make. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you so much, Chimwemwe. Thank you so much. You know, I was just writing when you were striking those calls. Those were very high notes we all needed to hear. Thank you so much. Brilliant point, brilliant submission. There is, there is one key area that, that was jumping out, jumping at me when you, were, when you were talking about those key seven points. The point number four, you talk about more funding, more funds for health and more heads out of this front. Brilliant, that, that, that's a very compelling statement. And that'll bring me to Dr. Kadiri once again. If you remember the Abuja Declaration of 20, 2001, and one of the key things that came out of that Abuja Declaration was that every African country should increase their healthcare budget to 15% out of their national budget, that's what should be allocated to healthcare, minimum 15%, so that we can move away from the single digit budgetary provision to double digit. You know, I was reading some, some articles, I think that was on Monday, I realized only two countries in Africa have done this. That is Rwanda and South Africa. And research even says, Several other countries, instead of increasing the healthcare budget, they further reduced it. Dr. Kadri, <laughs> has this been an issue? If the healthcare budget, you know, the, the statement uh, uh, were made was more funds for healthcare and more health out of this fund. That's very complex because most times the funds are made available but wrongly appropriated. And that's another key issue. What what do you think? What are your views, Dr. Kadiri, on this issue? I want to hear from you. Um, sentiments aside, emotions aside, at this point in time, it's very logical that, you know, if we, the leaders are not doing the right thing, the followers should be seen doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. It's very pertinent that when we have poor governance, who then make these changes? Who then make sure that there are, you know, there's a mobilization that whether online, offline petitioning, things that need to be done. When COVID happened, it just exposed all the challenges we have in our healthcare system in Africa, in the world, but of course, let's narrow it down to Africa. Millionaires, zillionaires couldn't buy their health. And some of them even died. And so at this point in time, when we look at that declaration and we see have here, if, we, if I'm to speak for us in Nigeria, it's still less than 5%. And we're advocating for universal health coverage here, whereby um, you know, these services should be available, affordable, accessible, and of course, 
acceptable by the users. At what point are we going to ever get to that, you know, that, that level where we do not do out of the pocket payment for our healthcare? It's high time we call thing a spade a spade. It's high time where we are not just on Twitter making noise, but make it a reality by bringing the, you know, the, go, the leadership in each of these African countries into what they are supposed to do. They are there to serve us, not the other way around. The poor governance is so frustrating in the sense that we are not building doctors and nurses for the developed world. Because it's actually cheaper to train doctors and nurses here. Yep. And you see, there's an exodus. In fact, it's a time bomb waiting to explode in Nigeria as I speak right now. Because I have colleagues that when I call them, I have to ask them, which country are, you, are we discussing from? Because the doctor or nurse I saw yesterday had just relocated to UK or Canada. It's amazing. Or the person will answer you and it's like, mm, uh, I'm sleeping. I'm like, it's 12 noon here in Nigeria. Where are you speaking from? It's a time bomb waiting to explode. So that is why, yes, if we know that we have good, poor governance, what are we doing in the 54 African countries? Let's take away Rwanda. You know, anytime I go to Rwanda, like, God, these people had genocide and see the way things just changed overnight for them. So we, the other African countries, we are the giant of Africa. Hello, Nigerians on board. Hey, but what really, if we know that health is wealth? And it's, the, the, it's, it's so rhyme with the way it goes. Health is wealth, right? And COVID came and like what um, Chin, Chin said, the truth is, this is not going to be the last pandemic. Some of us didn't experience the Spanish, but some of us are experiencing this. And it will be in history that there was a global pandemic in 2020. What are we doing about universal health coverage? What are we ensuring? What doing in, 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 in cases where we don't have to do out of the pocket payment? How are we making sure all hands are on deck in ensuring that health is actually in the fourth burner and what is proper what is allocated should be done properly implemented and of course executed so key stakeholders must be brought to book naming and shaming for some african countries is not is not an issue if you like shout from here to tomorrow don't care you, they will tell you they can't shame the shameless, right? But there are other ways I strongly believe we need to, you know, put our hands on deck in putting things together because truly health is wealth, not only just about the health of the economy, the GDP will increase, productivity will increase, profitability will increase, holistic you know, um, changes, attitudinal even changes towards our healthcare system. All these are all parameters that we see changing as we you know, put more money into our healthcare, prepare policies that are implemented and rightfully executed. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaderi. Thank you so much. I, I wish I wish the shameless can, can, can still feel ashamed someday. <laughs> Thank you so much. That, that, that's so explicit. But th there's something that, 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 that jumped out of your, of your discussion. The, the exodus of African doctors to the West. Um, I am aware of this. I went to speak to final year students who were leaving the medical school about three years ago now. And while I, was, while I was speaking to them, the choice, the, the options they have, I mean, why they leave medical school, what to prepare for. But my, 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 really, uh, um, my really aim was to see how I can galvanize younger ones to look at occupational health as a choice to make when they leave medical school. But while, while I finished speaking, one of the young, doctor, young doctors escorted me out and he told me, sir, it's a very great presentation you made, but I need to let you know 90% of those students you were speaking to, they're already writing their flag. They want to move to UK. They have not left medical school. They are writing international exams to leave. So that means we train them to help us look at the patients in Nigeria. 
as they're leaving medical school, they are moving abroad. And this is because the government across Africa, we have not been able to allocate funding, proper funding to healthcare systems in Africa. Even the ones that, were, that have been allocated, they have been misappropriated. They have not been channeled rightly to the right cause. This has become a key issue. Dr. Moyo, I'll come to you on this. We are all Africans and no one can help. We can, if we cannot solve our problems, external people cannot help us. We need to look in what. What do you think we can do in this regard? We need to keep these younger doctors in our system because the more doctors we have, the, the, the stronger our capacity to respond. Now we build capacity, the capacity we built are exported. What do you think we can do, government at national level, in ensuring that, I mean, even his policy, what do you think we, we are trying to, because it looks like healthcare system is not attractive to them in Africa anymore. So they have to look, look outward to where healthcare system has become attractive. What do you think we can do differently in ensuring that we are, we are able to control this space? Thank you very much. Or, 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 or are we also planning to leave? Let me know. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. I'm still in Zimbabwe and I'll continue here. <laughs> now, thank you very much, A. So maybe before I uh, speak to that um, uh, remark, let me just uh, point uh, the audience to a comment that has been posted by Claudina Nogueria from South Africa, the vice president of uh, ICO, where she has been talking about the issue of fund that much, much of the funding for health globally, as well as in Africa, is earmarked for treatment and compensation. It is high time that some of the funding should be directed to preventive measures. I think um, that's a very solid and um, sound statement that Claudina has put there, that in fact, when we move from uh, a medical approach to a health systems approach, we then need to capacitate and uh, put channel resources towards preventive mechanisms across workplaces, rather than um, channeling all funding, all resources to our uh, downstream, rather, so to speak. So that's why I thought that was an excellent point that I needed to highlight. In terms of the Oxodas, the movement, I think um, this is a process that has been there uh, from time immemorial. <laughs> Even uh, pre-COVID era, we have always had this Exodus so far. Health, personnel um, migrating to the West. But however, um, I think I'll speak from an uh, occupational safety and health perspective in terms of uh, how best we can improve the working conditions. We all know that, uh, yes, money is not the key motivator in terms of um, remuneration, but however, other, there are other key and pertinent motivators and they are looking at them, their wellness, their safety of these health personnel, that uh, it is high time that across Africa, we build resilient systems, sound occupational safety and health management systems, where the doctors and nurses are not overworked. We all know um, the working patterns, at times the working patterns um, are really out of this world, basically are driven by the doctor or nurse patient ratios, which bring with them quite um, Pro, very long hours, uh, people are on successive days on shift work. By the way, we all are aware that even shift work itself has been registered as a carcinogen. So that in itself also brings a multiplicity of problems. So I think uh, generally Africa and all other countries where there has been this exodus, from an occupational um, approach, it will be ideal and quite fundamental to make sure that uh, the health workers, like we mentioned, even like uh, the first speaker mentioned, that the, the psychological impact has been a major issue. Then you can imagine the psychological impact, the low remuneration, uh, the difficult working conditions. Obviously, that um, builds up and uh, drives these um, young doctors and nurses uh, to go abroad. But I think we can do better by establishing healthier and safer workplaces where risks are managed, where we there are sound programs within workplaces. At the moment, like I said earlier on, and from my experience in the region, you tend to find that um, the safety and health of health workers is not there. Go to most of these health institutions and try and look for um, 
a, 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 a health and wellness center or an occupational health center that looks directly to the occupational exposures. Because all we know that the healthcare industry has been documented as one of the most hazardous workplaces. And yet it is um, poorly recognized, um, not given the attention and the resources. Obviously what it then means that these doctors and nurses, they work under difficult conditions without uh, the maintenance and the promotion of the highest degree of uh, physical, mental and social well-being as per the definition. So I think there is still quite a lot that can be done. But um, my word is uh, to all governments across Africa is that this is time now to put in place sound occupational safety and health management systems. Uh, for your own information, I was just uh, we were, um, doing some literature review. To date, we have got so many countries that have not even ratified the International Labor Convention um, 155 on Occupational Safety and Health or the Convention 161 on Occupational Health Services because that demonstrates commitment at the national level, which will then be complemented by the implementation of uh, workplace programs that includes the healthcare sector. But um, issues of risk management are not. Uh, thanks to the African uh, Union Development Agency, and also to the government of Lesotho, who I think uh, have led a process of, uh, of training their, all their ministries in risk management. In fact, occupational safety and health is all about managing occupational risk in the workplaces. And uh, Lesotho has taken the lead. And I think um, most countries can take a lead from there, where we start the basics in terms of making workplaces safer. Yes. Remuneration might be much less, but I tell you, uh, for everyone, your safety and health and your wellness, those are key fundamentals, uh, ideally, to a happy life, uh, so to speak. Thank you so very much. For, I might not have answered your question correct, uh, comprehensively. You did, you did, you did. <laughs> but, but you did. Most comfortable, most comfortable for me is that you are not leaving. That, that's, that's, that's the most reassurance I got from you, okay? Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moyo. That, that was very thank excellent. You. And I want to see how we can look at the issue that surrounds occupational health in the healthcare sector. You talk about the overdraw of nurses, healthcare worker working beyond normal limit, beyond the capacity. These are, these are things that we don't have. I mean, as, as a matter of fact, the healthcare system most times are not seen as workplaces. It is seen as places where people go to receive care. But COVID-19 has, has reshaped our attention, brought us back to the point to make us understand that, firstly, healthcare system is a workplace, a workplace where people can get treated and get healed and go home. So a lot of nurses, healthcare workers, nurses, doctors, they were overwhelmed within this period. What this has taught us also is that why we saw healthcare system as a place in, in quote for clinical intervention. We didn't see it as a place for preventive health. Preventive health is where occupational health also falls into. We saw healthcare as a place of clinical intervention, but I mean, they all, it all played out that those who are going to administer this intervention also first need to be taken care of. As a matter of fact, some campaigns in the US right now are talking about care for caregiver, because even the caregiver right now also need care. What do we do? How do we stylishly bring um, occupational health training capacity building into the healthcare sector? We need to have occupational health and safety managers in healthcare systems. We need to have ergonomists in the healthcare system. We need to have hygienists in the healthcare system. Have you ever seen where, where a nurse, two nurses are pulling a woman that is overweight? or a man that is overweight, trying to pull him from one bed to the other. It, I mean, those are huge ergonomic condition. Chin, how do we take, I mean, rechannel our focus so that we can also keep a zoom light on healthcare system in building occupational health and safety capacity among healthcare workers. Please help us on, on this. All right, no, thank you very much. I think that is a very interesting subject. And I think I'll build on what Dr. Moyo talked about earlier, the example that he gave about Lesotho. 
Because I think we are coming from somewhere, even before COVID. Um, I remember we have a project that is looking at tuberculosis and occupational lung disease um, in the Southern Africa region. And our focus is to look at the preventive side of things so that we institute strong occupational health and safety systems in the different work settings where workers are vulnerable to tuberculosis. And our initial focus was mining. But then when we started interacting with the countries that we are working with, we realized that the healthcare uh, settings, um, prisons, um, and other work environments have to also be addressed. So I will zero into healthcare workers where I think your question is. When we started discussing and dialoguing with the healthcare workers, we noticed that to them, as long as infection prevention and control is done, that's enough. IPC to them, and that's it. And to them, their safety is assured. But I think the issue is going beyond infection prevention and control. How much awareness is there among healthcare workers when it comes to the broader aspects about occupational health and safety? Issues around economics, issues around working time, issues around all other aspects of occupational health and safety, you will realize that normally it is not there. So we started from the point of creating awareness, building the interest so that the healthcare workers in Lesotho and in the other countries where we are working, start understanding and buying in to the fact that where they're working, they also need to have occupational health and safety systems that go beyond infection prevention and control. So I think this advocacy and awareness helped um, in unlocking some of the challenges that we were facing initially when it comes to impacting on uh, occupational health and safety amongst healthcare workers. So in our quest to do something in the healthcare setting, we partnered with ILO and WHO. And I'm sure you know the program called HealthWise that is implemented, it's healthcare, I mean, it's occupational health for healthcare workers. So we started partnering with them and you see the fundamental importance of partnerships where all of us then came together and said, let's build capacity. Because sometimes we assume that because they're in health, then they know, and then they understand. So we said, okay, let's start with building capacity. And we noted that the starting point should be what you've just referred to, that AUDN effort, then spearheaded, we realized that we need to start from doing risk assessments, which are things that we've been doing over time. But I think what I'm trying to emphasize here is the fact that let us create awareness. Let us do enough advocacy. Let us put resources into it. And once we do that, let us train the right people within the healthcare settings. And we are trying to do that. Normally, we, ask, we, we, we do the same things and expect a different result. And what we are trying to do now is to do certain things differently because if we keep doing the same thing, we get the same result. So we're trying to see how we can do certain things differently and you know engage them more and in a participatory manner so that we reform occupational health and safety in the healthcare settings. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chimwewe. Thank you so much for such a very good highlight. I, I have been told there are a lot of questions buzzing uh, within the within the uh, um, chat room. So uh, Miriam. Do you want to help us out with those questions? Yes, so that we, um, they're, they're actually more comments. So I thought it was very interesting. And I do thank the people making comments in the chat box. But I have a particular request if it's not putting someone on the spot because I haven't talked to you in a while. And Norman, I see you had, Norman Koza, I see you had a good comment in response to a question that Kevin Hedges asked. So Norman, would, would it be okay for you to unmute yourself and, and make your comment? Uh, just oh, yes, yes, uh, um, Mariana, thank you very much. Um, I, I was just responding to what Kevin just asked, and I think it was, it's, it's an interesting uh, question, and at least we know the genesis of that pro I mean, problem. Um, it has been staying with you know, WHO and CDC for quite some time. And my reaction was, um, even, even today, actually, uh, I think yesterday there was a circular that came out where they stopped all contact sports in 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 high schools and primary schools 
And, and the reason is still going back there in terms of, you know, uh, looking at chromite instead of aerosol, you know, um, uh, transmission. It's like they're still com complaining about chromite. So, so, so my answer to Kevin was that it looks like we're not changing. It looks like, you know, that problem actually still persisting actually, because, you know, sports, you have got a contact sport and non-contact sport, but even within the contact sport, you know, you, there are people who are playing outside in the open where there's natural ventilation, others with ventilation. So these were not factored and these decisions also are not, you know, backed by data to say we are closing contact for because we've got 100 people who are um, contaminated and stuff like that. So we, we are not informed, you know, there's, there's, there's no information in that. So I just wanted to, to, to just comment on one Kevin, uh, Kevin has said. Thank you very Thank much. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Norman. Thank you, Norman. Uh, Abdul Qadir Suleiman has his hand up. Uh, uh, thank you, Mariana, for uh, for the work. Uh, first, I want uh, uh, to say thank you to all the good presentations. And uh, my point uh, is in relation to what uh, 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 Miss uh, uh, Chandimba said in her last intervention about uh, uh, focusing on. Uh, on the healthcare workers and educating them and uh, uh, putting the right people in, uh, in, in, in the jobs to, to, to work for risk assessment and such. Uh, I, I, can, um, I, I once talked to a, a Minister of Health uh, official uh, in, in Kenya uh, about uh, occupational health generally. And uh, what he told me was that uh, uh, at that time before uh, the onset of uh, COVID-19, told me that um, malaria and tuberculosis are much bigger, much bigger public health issues affecting those who are working and those who are not working. So talking, uh, focusing and putting resources on uh, occupational health and developing occupational health always takes uh, the back seat to public health. So the policies which are developed, we talk, we hear, we heard about uh, uh, the African countries being very good in developing policies uh, to deal with uh, uh, outbreaks of, of diseases. This is okay, and it works very well as long as public health is concerned. So, but where is there? There is a boundary between public health and occupational health because when we're talking of occupational health and we're talking of about contagious diseases like uh, COVID-19, we're talking about one worker transmitting it to another worker. And then in addition to that, uh, they get, uh, there's possibility of being transmitted from uh, other people outside their working place. So how much of policy development in dealing with occupational health is developed in Africa? We know in the public health sector, the development of policy, it's efficient and it's working, but uh, it, does it work in the same way when it comes to occupational health? This is my question. Maybe one of the speakers can uh, reply to. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abdul Kader. Let's quickly take that. Chim, do you want to, Chim, do you want to take, uh, take that out of the moyo? you want to answer that? Um, Chim, I can Moyo, start. Yeah. Yes, I can start and then Dr. Moyo can, can, can respond, I mean, can, can add on. Um, I think one important issue I think that he has raised is that as a continent, and most of the countries on the continent have focused on issues of TB, HIV, AIDS, and malaria, and they have put aside um, issues of occupational health. And I think it's the way we have sold occupational health to the people in the key positions, to the policymakers. Understanding that workers' health has a direct impact on public health. Sure. Because what that means is, I may come from a community A with my tuberculosis and take it to the workplace and transmit it in the workplace. And in the workplace, I transmit it to somebody who is coming from community B. So it is taking my tuberculosis from community A to community B. So I think it is a way that we have sold occupational health. And this is what we are trying to do. And I think on the African continent, we are trying to see how we can start to sell the story this way and ensuring that we are able to show that the development that we are talking about, the economics that we are talking about, we are not going to be able to achieve anything unless 
we, uh, we address issues of worker health and safety. So countries are starting to make steps. Um, and I think in some countries, there are significant steps. Um, I'll give examples of where we are working, the countries where we are working, countries like Malawi, uh, Lesotho, uh, Mozambique, uh, Zambia, where we are seeing real changes in policies, real changes in laws, adopting standard operating procedures that are fundamental for addressing occupational health issues, that being complemented with training experts. So I think one, we, 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 we might be able to tackle this one country at a time, but I'm sure sooner or later, the whole continent is going to follow. And if we all work together and say the same story and say our occupational health in that regard, we should be able to make the change that we require on the continent. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Moyo and Dr. Kadiri, if they want to add to this, let's hear from you. Just in brief, um, responding to the question, I think one major issue is that in terms of policy, um, directed towards OSH. Currently, the policies are inadequate and fragmented, and they lack uh, the fundamentals of occupational safety and health. You find a piece of uh, some part of occupational health in one of the labor policies, then something is lying in the Ministry of Health or in mining, etc. So there is so much fragmentation. But part of that has also been due to lack of capacity in terms of the human resources. We find that there are very few institutions in Africa that train uh, in occupational safety and health or even in occupational health or occupational medicine. And even in most governments, you tend to find that um, we have got, uh, um, we are deficient in terms of uh, occupational safety and health expertise. And that's the transformational uh, um, change that needs to take place uh, sooner rather than later. But of course, the wheels are slowly uh, beginning to turn, like what Chimwemwe has put across. That uh, those countries, I think uh, you mentioned Zambia, Malawi, uh, Lesotho, Mozambique, where there's been quite significant policy changes in terms of occupational safety and health. But at the moment, I think uh, there needs to be consented and emphatic efforts to try and uh, articulate the occupational safety and health agenda in a much stronger way uh, than ever before. But more importantly, we need to develop capacity in occupational safety and health, in occupational medicine, et cetera. We, we, we are still lacking in that. And uh, my challenge to most governments is let's invest in occupational safety and health. But more importantly, I think our frontline workers during this period of the pandemic, they, we need to have policies that speak directly to the health and wellness of our frontline workers in COVID. And that has to be articulated within the context and space of occupational safety and health in order to effectively and comprehensively fight uh, the COVID pandemic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Kadiri, Miriam, I see your hand up. I'll come to you, but let me hear from Dr. Kadiri first. No, not, not really. Um, Chimer and um, Moyo have said a lot regarding this question, so I'm not going to overflog it, but I just want to make one point um, clear. Occupational health is part of public health. When we look at any living adult, your waking hours, two third of it is spent in the workplace. Yeah. So if we do not take charge of our occupational health issues, it becomes a public health not only pandemic, epidemic, and it will be a disaster. So capacity building, especially in the human resources department for occupational health is most needed right now in the push, in the advocacy, implementation, reforms, and of course, execution of all these reforms. Thank you so much, Dr. Kadiri. Thank you so much. Yeah, Miriam, you have, your hand is up. Yeah, yes, I did, thank you. Um, I did have a question, but actually your latest comments inspired me to make a comment. So I'll make my comment first. Um, I, you know, I totally agree with you that uh, occupational health is part of public health. And, and we've certainly learned that uh, in spades during the pandemic. Uh, one thing we had learned in WHWB before the pandemic was you can't draw a bubble around the workplace and Chim when we, what you said about communities spreading you know somebody from community comes to the workplace and then brings an infectious disease to another community 
uh, that is so true. I mean, we've learned that the community is the workplace in many cases. Sometimes the home is the workplace. So the kind of knowledge and skills that we have as occupational health and safety professionals has been too narrowly defined. And we certainly learned that during COVID. So if you think of what our capacity is and our skills is, it's more about exposure assessment and control, not just in the workplace. So if we think about that, there's a lot of lot we can do to building capacity and that kind of expertise. And did want to mention that WHWB is has been working with OSH Africa, and you know we worked with uh, Norman and Shimwemwe to offer some some training in Africa. So we we're certainly interested in doing more of that. If if anyone on the call doesn't know about us, we're we're happy to tell you more. So that was my comment. I had just a very specific question on one issue that was raised during uh, Dr. Kadiri's presentation, and that was about vaccines. I, I'd be curious to know more about what's the situation in Africa with regard to vaccines, uh, because we're certainly hearing about, um, you know, lack of availability of vaccines. Do you see the more, uh, the wealthier countries as kind of hoarding vaccines that they should be sharing more with developing countries? And, and what's the situation th there? Thank you very much for that question. <laughs> Vaccine equity is what we are advocating for. And I'm happy that COVAX came in. COVAX is the alliance with, um, with the WHO and UNICEF. And yes, they have brought in some, but the truth is, is it going to go around? Uh, would the conspiracy theory even prevent people from taking this vaccine. So it's not even about availability now. We also have to look at those that are supposed to be taking it, taking it. We've had over, um, over 1.5 billion people vaccinated globally, uh, but how many people are we vaccinated in Nigeria, in Africa? It's still very small in, 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 in ratio to the global figure. Um, you saw, um, we heard about the CDC in the United States even coming on board and say those vaccinated can even come out without face masks and all that. But we haven't gotten there yet. We are not there yet in, from the African perspective. Um, uh, for, for those of us, for, for example, in Nigeria, the majority took their first vaccine. The second uh, phase will start this month and spin over to June. Um, South Africa already doing theirs. And so the vaccine equity is still grossly um, inappropriate. And we are hoping that the government sits up to take charge, not only waiting for the um, developer to supply or support us with the vaccine, also ensuring they put their money where their mouth is. I think that's how you say it, mouth where your money is or money where your mouth is. And make sure that the, co the continent get vaccinated. That is what we are advocating. So aside from COVAX coming to the rescue, the government of each of these countries also have to take charge in ensuring that the populace, the citizens get vaccinated. Because we have, if we have to get to herd immunity with vaccination, we aren't, we are very, very far from, 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 from that because getting herd immunity will mean that, you know, we need, you know, uh, people vaccinated, people that are infected, at least 60, 70% of the population. We are, we are not going to get there anytime soon if we have to wait for that. So there's, there's, the, the ratio is still very poor and we are hoping that we get um, 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 more in Africa because truly less than, two to 3% of the vaccine that have been produced globally are yet to be sent to African countries. So this is, a, this is an advocacy and a drive for vaccine equity. Thank you. Thank, thank uh, you maybe so much. Maybe you can allow me, Chair, to just add one yes, more. Yes, please go ahead, go ahead. All right, okay, thank you. Actually, the, the previous speaker is really right about the issue of um, availability of vaccines. I think that, when we look at it from the continent's perspective, it's not about lack of resources. Governments have said we have these resources and we would like to procure the vaccines. And unfortunately, the issue of hoarding 
the issue of vaccines not being available, while other developed countries have three doses per person, we have not even one dose per 100 people. We, we, we really are quite very low. That's why I think on the continent, there are also some efforts that have been taken. Um, the Africa acquisition, African Union acquisition platform for vaccines, we, they're trying, they're trying to advocate and trying to do something about acquisition of the vaccine. Um, a lot of advocacy, but it also takes on, I mean, our colleagues from the other side to be able to release them. Um, on the, the second part that I wanted to also highlight is that we have now started as a, as a continent, we've started thinking beyond COVID-19 to say, yes, this has happened. You see, we have depended on others to produce the vaccine and for us to access the vaccine. And it has not worked. And we're not sure if it is going to work in the next one year. So you will see that now the dialogue at the AU level among the heads of state is that how do we improve capacity to produce our own vaccines on the continent? Some countries have made investments, huge investments already. Countries like Rwanda, South Africa, Algeria, Senegal, on the continent have already made a huge commitment that we want to start manufacturing of vaccines. So this is the, now the drive and this is where we want to head to as a continent. And we are hoping that partners will work with us when it comes to the vaccine, vaccine manufacturing on the continent. Thank you. Thank you so much. These are the kind of things I want to hear. If COVID-19 has to come to make us think and look inward, let's have more COVID-19. Don't you agree with me? <laughs> We're just kidding. <laughs> so I'm happy to see, I'm happy to see that we are thinking and looking inward because COVID-19 has come. So that we can, I mean, we, we also suffer about the same time. And uh, Esther, I see you are calling you just now. We all suffer about the same time. So we're not looking inward so that we can do our own thing. I'm, I'm very happy to hear to hear that that discussion already up. I will follow up and see where that leads us. Thank you so much, Chiwen. Uh, Esther Ayaba from Ghana, your hand has been up since. Unmute yourself and ask a question. My contribution is um, about the limitation knowledge of uh, operational health, concerning about our health workers. Um, Dr. Mariamo did mention that when the outbreak uh, issue occurred, okay, it's like a lot of people die out of this, fine. But a situation whereby you go to hospital and a little knowledge about occupation, they will not ask you, maybe I report some particular symptoms for three times or two times, instead of the doctor looking at the history and then said that, oh, where do you work? Um, um, our president, you can bear with me. Sometimes they will not even ask of that. They yeah, just yeah. prescribe. Meanwhile, you are suffering of the one particular disease that is preventable. So I think um, African countries, they need to train more health workers on operational medicine, especially the nurses and the doctors. As for the health and safety, it is already taken care of that. And besides that, the facilities, how do we run them? Is it that it's something that we always just look at? What is fast track so that we will just go there? Or is it that we always have to wait for a, a European countries or our donor support people to teach us what to do, not concerning or not talking or thinking about our people. I think uh, this is happening. We, we could have done much better than this to me, the way I'm seeing, but the problem is the staff too, that one. And the scope is not properly described or is not understanding well for most of uh, health workers, because occupational health and safety is sub of uh, public health. No any health worker will go through the training without knowing a basic, a little bit about occupational health before you specialize in certain areas. I think um, that is my contribution, but um, we should look at those things in future. And it looks like it is new. It's a new in the pool of African continent, anybody just take something and start doing uh, oh, sure, something else. Sure, sure, sure. So we should well, look at that one. Thank, thank you. you. We, got, we got your very valid point. 
One of the key things we're going to have as our focus in Osh Africa in 2022 is training the healthcare worker on Osh. Very valid. That's our, one of our 2022 major projects is focusing our efforts in looking at the healthcare workers and building capacity in the area of occupational health. I mean, the, it, it, there's a whole lot of lack in, in that area. I mean, deficiency of information. We need to just we need to scale up that 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 area. This year, we're looking at at at, uh, at um, uh, labor inspector us and labor inspectors. But next year, we are going to zoom on training building capacity within the healthcare sector because the the nurses, the doctors, healthcare leadership. As a matter of fact, I'm a patient safety advocate. It's a big issue. We need to start speaking to healthcare leader healthcare leaders on even occupational safety. We need to start from the gate house to the bedside and to the boardroom. We need to see how we can, we can take this discussion forward in 2021. That's a very valid point where we see what we can do about this within our purview in 2021. We, we, I think we're running out of, out of time now, maybe if I'm right. I think uh, there has been a hand that has been uh, there for long for Enoch, I think Enoch Satira. Oh, Enoch, please come on, come on. Let's, let's hear from you. Thank you. I mean, it was technology that was playing games. I'm, I, I'm from Zimbabwe, and um, I, I'm quite interested. In, I mean, I, I mean, with the discussion going on so far, but uh, I, I think we are concentrating more on deliveries that uh, the healthcare workers can do on their part. What What, what are the implications of uh, our financial models? Uh, do they support what we want to see happen? I mean, as compared to what is happening in the Western world. We note that in Africa, mainly people finance this um, health care through out of pocket monies rather than through um, well established funding models that can actually support the cause that they want to see happen. I don't know whether what we would want to see happen can be supported by the amount of monies that we see circulating in the health industry. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Enoch. First thing we have to drive, which of course we have to get, is to, like uh, Chibwewe mentioned, is to get leadership commitment. Once we get leadership commitment right across country level, the financial models will come in place. Once we have those commitments that they recognize occupational health as an issue in their country, financial support that will come from that, from that commitment will follow. But we have to first see how we can drive leadership commitment. But one thing that I also want to, want to put across to, to Chimwemwe, I think, in, in, I don't know if this can happen this year or maybe some first quarter of next year, we need to create, if, if possible, create a stakeholders meeting that will be made up of maybe um, a director of OSH in each country or ministers of OSH in each country. Let's come on that, on that, on that, one, on, on that one room and have our session. We'll look at ourselves in the, in the eyes and tell ourselves the truth. If that's where we have issues, we talk about it. If that's where we need support, we talk about it. We need to have that, that discussion. I don't know when this will happen, but I'll come back to you on this and see what we, how we can put this together. There was something that, that uh, I think it was Abdul Kadir that mentioned it, that we are good at, at drawing policies, but we are very weak in implementation. So I need, I need um, um, every of the speaker to speak on this. And also there was a point also that came in, uh, while we talk about the vaccine and the vaccine conspiracy, there are people that live in the hither land, the, the villages, even farmers, how do we bring these vaccines across to these people, knowing that knowing where they live is not like those that live in the cities? So please, um, maybe anyone can start and, and, and take this and uh, while we draw this, uh, this webinar to a conclusion. Okay, um, let, me, let me say something, um, and this will be my concluding remarks as well. Uh, that um, from the AU's perspective, um, we really are committed to supporting uh, the process uh, of improving OSH in Africa. And the issue that you've raised as regards to policies, having good policies doesn't mean um, that they will be implemented and they'll bring the change that is required, which is absolutely right. That's why I think in any reform process that we are going to take, it's not about reforming the policies. It's not just about changing the laws and regulations. It's about having a systemic approach, a systematic approach in addressing occupational health and safety. What do I mean? Firstly, 
once you reform the policies, once you pass the laws that are more up to date and meet international standards, we need to think about the critical mass that is required to transform those policies into practice. That's why in all our approach and implementation, we've looked at reforming the landscape, the policy landscape, but we've also focused a lot on looking at existing capacities so that we are able to train the right people so that they are able to offer the services that are required at the national level. Secondly, continuous learning, knowledge sharing, information sharing, advocacy, and communication. These are fundamental tenets, not to forget the issue of financing. There has to be resources, as the colleague from Zimbabwe, I think Enoch, just recently um, provided input, there have to be resources to transform all those things that are on paper into action. So we need to look at these aspects and ensure that each one of them is given the right attention that it requires. Thank you very much. And thank you for this opportunity to be part of this discussion. Thank you so much, Chibwewin. Dr. Moyo, can I can we hear from you now? And maybe if you very much, I think in, remark. Yeah, my closing remark is um let's call upon governments uh and all those um in high authorities to look towards the issue of capacity building in occupational health and safety across uh, the continent. Let's build capacity and improve um, the practice of occupational safety and health across the space. Thank you very much. Thank you, so much Dr. Thank you so much, Dr. Moyo. Dr. Thank Kaduri. You. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity, building on my co-speakers, um, um, knowledge and as an addendum, I still call upon, of course, proper ecosystem that is sustainable, that we thrive, not only survive. We are all survivors being here, but we the most important thing is to thrive. But if having that sustainable ecosystem can see to these things, and of course, capacity building, tax shifting, Sometimes it's because the human resources in this field is quite limited, but tax shifting can do some, you know, good things with regards to, um, you know, reforms. But proper execution when these policies are made is what we advocate more for. It's very beautiful to always have policies in papers. Let's walk the talk, not just talk the talk. Talk is cheap. Thank you so much, Dr. Kadiri. That, that, that's, that's a word we, we must live with. Let's walk the talk. Talk is cheap. Thank you so much. Well, I must, I must at this point, thank you so much, Dr. Kadiri, Dr. Moyo Dingani, and Chiwewe Chandimba for coming to, I mean, open up this space for us or to listen. I mean, we looked at people that we knew in Africa, but it was so important that we reach out to three of you. You know, my guess was right that you guys would do justice to this topic. We didn't want to sugarcoat what was happening. We went, we went also say it the way it is so that we, we all know where we really are. Until we know where we are, where the, where the, where the shoe, where it pinches, we will know how to correct it or change the shoes. So what we have said today, very, very, very uh, strong conversation, we need to take this forward. This, this, this meeting is not going to end here. I'm still going to come back to uh, three of you. We are still going to do something stronger on this in pushing this into the future. One thing we must start doing, which of course, what, what, one of the things that Dr. Kadri mentioned earlier, we have to start knocking on all the doors. Whether we name, we, 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 we shame the shameless, that's not the issue. <laughs> they will not they will never feel ashamed. What we will do is, <laughs> We'll keep looking at how we can coerce them into conversation. One of the things we started, we will be launching in Osh Africa is having the Osh Africa TV online. What that will do for us will bring the minister of Osh from Botswana to the show, to the hotspot. Tell us what you have done in Osh in Botswana. Bring the minister of Osh of, of a, a labor and employment in Nigeria to the hotspot so that we can't sit, Africa is big. We, we can't sit in our different countries and begin to know what is happening in, 
we need to have a system that is coordinated where everyone can come and speak. We are all able to hear ourselves. So this is this will be launched in the two months from now, and we need to we need to see take that that every country comes on board every month. Tell us what is happening in your country. This will also help us know those that are strong and know those that are weak. When we have those that are weak and they are quiet, the one who has strength will not know the area to help the weak. We need to pull this, bring the strong in, bring the weak in so that the strength of the strong can complement the weakness of the weak in the link. And this is what we want to do. Africa belongs to all of us. To build Africa, it needs everyone's responsibility. If we don't do what we have to do before we leave this earth, our children will come and look for us. I'm not sure they will speak about us on a nice note. We were so nice to speak about our parents on a good note. They had their own errors, but we let it slide. This is our time. We have a lot to do. We must commit to it to ensure that we build the Africa of our dreams.